time. Uh, I'm going to share with you what we are doing currently. It is trying to get to know our users better. And our users are children in the classroom. So we are looking into search logs. And so the first um, presentation was interesting in terms of visualization, but even more so uh, what David was talking about. And we are combining search logs with expert grading in order to define the children's search roles and the play in the classroom when they search for educational targeting. So the motivation behind what we are doing, in, oops, okay, I'll do it for you. The motivation is that, as we said, children regularly use uh, search engines that have not been designed for them to use for um, school and also entertainment kind of activities. Uh, and so they have problems in uh, finding their ways. Uh, they do that both at school and at home, and uh, they find many barriers in doing that. So, for instance, we cannot read that, unfortunately, but when you search for something that is a school topic, ancient Rome, you get a um, lot of interesting content that is not written for children to understand, unfortunately. And children have also problems not only with language, but also with attention. So children struggle to uh, nav navigate swiftly in this great number of results and we found that they particularly need help in scanning search engine result pages so we, we look into that as well there is a gap in the sense that search engines should better support children because they are users of search engines they are not just small adults so they don't just uh, use uh, a, in a smaller way uh, what the adults use they are transforming, changing, and developing skills also in terms of reading and writing and distinguishing good uh, information from bad information. So we try to uh, dig into this um, uh, understanding of uh, our users and investigate how they, they struggle and also how we can provide some scaffolding for them and who should provide this scaffolding for them. Where do we start? Well, children come with uh, different ages, with different interests, background, experience, and also they have to deal with different types of tasks in different contexts. So we take the assumption that the one size does not fit everybody. We are inspired, and in this we are very desired, uh, as Jan Maria said in the beginning this morning, by a in a, an 11 year old work presented by Alison Bruin and made with her group at CDIR in 2010, where they define seven roles uh, children play when searching at home. And you already can see that they are tackling a different context than at home, and, um, but the age group is more or less at the same as ours, so it's interesting for us to start from there. So we have what everybody wants the power search, the searcher that can really. Um, get to what um, they're looking for and they know how to. They have the, the um, search strategy very clear in their mind. mind. But we also have the visual uh, searcher that is mostly attracted by visual content. So something in line with what Alexander was saying, maybe visualization can be helpful for them. Uh, we also have the rule bound searcher. The searcher will just tell you, oh, I only go to this website because my teacher, my sibling, my mom, my dad told me to stick to those. And um, this is a typology that you find frequently. The distracted one, we have distracted children that start and then they wave off because they see something cute, something nice, something that has nothing to do with what they were looking for. The content searcher, the one that just goes guess what uh, they are looking for and they're happy with that. They don't search anymore, they don't search anymore. Uh, the developing one uh, that is getting to become a power, power searcher, but it still lacks on the strategies and the ability to search. And finally, we have um, the non-motivated one that we want to tackle, of course, that is the one that is doing it just because the others are doing it as well, or because there is an, an extrinsic motivation uh, behind the search. So those were the seven roles that Alison Bruin and her group uh, came up with. How they did it? Well, they did it by interviewing and observing children searching at home. So they ran a qualitative study. They coded the, the results of the interview. They structured uh, this typology of roles. We, instead, are going into the classroom so a different context. And we are not interviewing, we are mostly using quantitative analysis on search logs and observations on the side and assignment grades. So we are mostly using quantities in terms of grades 
and um, search logs, and a pinch of observation here and there you will see where. So our work tries to see whether we can do the same magic with a different uh, procedure, something cheaper also. To help us in our uh, exploration, uh, we follow a framework we defined um, and presented in 2019 in Clay, where we are four pillars. We are the user group, and we went for the best um, children uh, age uh, you should tackle if you want to work with children, the nine to 11 years old. Why they're so good? Because they already know how to read and write, and uh, they have already been exposed to studying some uh, subjects. So you can really look into how they are developing their skills also in terms of search. The kind of task was a naturalistic, realistic, real task actually set by teachers, where children had to search for the three subjects, and you will see science, geography, and history. The context is, context is the classroom context, and that helped us a lot, and you will see how. And this is a strategy, we just gave them a very straightforward Bing uh, search tool with different uh, interfaces, uh, according to the studies uh, we, we ran with them. So in total, we had 172 children from 9 to 11, as I told you, eight years age group. And the context was the traditional classroom as long as it lasted. And then for the last year, we had to go online because of the COVID emergency. But we had some interesting findings there too. So uh, what we did was very ecological in a way. We reused uh, data from three studies. And the first one, uh, 75 participants, age 9 to 11. We asked them to pick uh, different topics from science, geography, and history. Uh, they were, of course, selected by teachers, so they were relevant to their curriculum. And we asked them to use uh, different interfaces, uh, the graphical traditional one versus the voice one. So the voice is coming back as well. It happens in a traditional classroom. The second study has 66 um, children uh, involved, 9 to 11, again, great age. They focus on the environment and what to, uh, to do in order to improve um, the health of our planet. Uh, the interface was a classic one, so graphical uh, interface, and the setting was traditional classroom. And then the last uh, study with the smallest group of children was run online. Um, the topic was ancient Rome, and the, the class uh, and, and the interface was a combination of traditional and emerging rich search. So graphical, but the plain one versus the emerging rich one. So the first challenge for us was to get from all these studies the search logs uh, we could analyze in order to extract um, the roles. What did we use? Where um, were well, a combination of clicks, length of the session, and positive and negative clicks. But before, I need to remind you that as much as in the original study by Alison Green, uh, children don't just play one role. They can play many different roles, even in the same search section. So we were very flexible about that, and we had to be very careful in identifying those. So we, um, in order to uh, recognize uh, the, development, the developing searcher, we look into the accuracy of the clicks and the grades they were getting. So we uh, explore very deeply uh, this type of uh, role uh, by looking into the fact that they were not particularly uh, precise in, in their clicking. And also they were, they were in the medium uh, range of grades, but also thanks to the observation from the teacher, we could see, and also for looking deeper, that uh, they particularly had problems with complex search tasks. So there was an issue there of um, search um, strategies not yet well developed. Uh, we uh, encountered through our data the distracted searcher because this searcher was taking a long time to perform a search that all the others were really taking a few minutes. And the medium accuracy in clicking and the uh, low or less than average uh, grades they were getting. So you see, we are using all the clues here. We distinguish the distracted from the non-motivated by the length of the search and by the fact that the non-motivated searcher was not going any deep into the search at all. So often they were just happy with the snippets to make up the result. They were not engaging uh, with the search, uh, with the search task at all. They were trying to minimize their effort, let's say. We also encounter the content searcher, you remember, is the one that goes straight to the answer and doesn't want to explore much. 
Uh, and again, we distinguish that from the non motivated and distracted because they got good grades at the end. So they really engaged with it, but they, they did a limited number of clicks. So they didn't explore and they were not curious. They were not really using searching for learning as an experience. And then, of course, our perfection, as so they would say, the power searchers, uh, they had high click accuracy and they had very high grades. So that was for us a to indicate that they had a good search strategy and they were also very motivated toward finding the answer. We also uh, couldn't find indicators. Fresh. Okay. No, we also couldn't find, uh, while you are teaching, I can tell you, we couldn't find two two of the original roles, one, the visual uh, searcher, because we did not have information about the visual content of the pages they were um, visiting. And um, the other one was a, a rule bound uh, searcher because we did not have ways to interview the children and find out whether they were following some heuristic in using some um, pages or, or others. Almost there. Almost there. Almost there. But uh, why we couldn't, Really find the two. Why we couldn't uh, really uh, find the seven roles as in the original study by Alison Bruin, we saw three more emerging. So one is really based on the uh, power and content together that we call the answer the searcher. We saw that some of the children were very motivated by the extrinsic uh, um, motivation by the teacher giving them a good grade. So they were really struggling to find the answer, even if they were not accurate. Perfect, sensational. We are at the right place. Yeah, great. So uh, the new emerging roles, uh, the, the interesting one was the stimulated searchers. So those that uh, when online were not performing that well, but when in the classroom were instead performing much better, were engaging for longer in the, in the task, and they were doing more tweaks. So we could see how the teacher and the peers in the classroom had an impact on children. And when left alone at home, were less simulated than when in the classroom. So we came out with this uh, simulated uh, searcher. The answer searcher I told you, extrinsic motivation, I want a good grade, so I do my best to, to get the result, but I'm not really interested in the topic. And the assisted searcher is the one that uh, uh, does more queries, uh, sends more queries because it's in, in, in the classroom context. So the three um, added uh, roles are very relevant for us because we want to explore them further. This is an example of how messy our data is and how really we had to um, use everything like the the context of the classroom, the observation from the teacher, the grading in order to make sense of these roles and, and recognize them. Uh, so you can see that we have the um, power uh, searches on the top. Uh, we have grades, I'm uh, oh, sorry, we have the student ID on the bottom. And then we have the different metrics we use. So we use the total clicks, the click position, so how deep they were going, how many of the positive clicks, so the, the good um, size they were picking, uh, how long was the search session, and their grade. So we used everything in order to make sense of our data. We had a good number of students, but still not enough to say we have something fine out there. Interesting findings. The context makes a difference. As I was telling before, when we, we moved from the classroom in person to the online, the length of the session dropped dramatically because children were not engaged and they needed their peers and their teacher to give them support and to stimulate them. So that's something very important for us to keep in mind because the online uh, context is going not to go away. So we need to take that into account. And uh, study number two, the one about the environment, uh, was a bit different than the others in terms of the number of clicks the children did, so that, that we measure in terms of um, engagement and involvement. So children really worked very hard in study number two because the stake, uh, the, the, the thing at stake was the health of our planet. We uh, gave them uh, emotionally charged tasks, uh, both positive and negative, 
asking them to find out how we can uh, make our planet better and what is making our planet suffer. And they really got very deeply into that. So that's something that made us wonder and, and think of using emotionally charged tasks more in order to engage our researchers. Here we have a very uh, quick summary of what was there from the original Alison Druin study. So all the roles they had, uh, that's the one we, we came up with. Um, remember, they use qualitative data from interviews and observations. Here we have also what we managed to extract from the traditional and the online class. Um, we have the main indicators in terms of click accuracy, number of clicks, uh, the length of the session, and so on, and a brief description of the um, extra roles we came up with. And I'll go back because I, I was in the, a bit messy when presenting those. So we have the simulated one. They were the one we observed in study number two, where the emotionally charged task made them really go deeper into the, um, the search. We have the answer ones that are a mixture between the, the power and the content. So children that, have, um, that are motivated by the extrinsic motivation of having a good grade. And then we have the assisted ones that were the ones in the classroom as compared to when they went online and let, uh, felt without any uh, support, they couldn't really perform that well. So we have these three new roles that we think are worth uh, further exploration. And we have a lot of interesting uh, findings to share with you. So um, the, we think that with all the pinch of observation here and um, interpretation there, uh, we can make sense of uh, log files and interpret them, especially if helped by, by some extra uh, information like the uh, teacher um, grades. Uh, we think that the classroom provide a nice environment to help the inter interpretation because we know that the, the motivation is made by, the topic is defined by, so we have a lot of information for us to reflect upon. We came up with these three new type of roles and there could be many more, it's just a proposal of course. Uh, we had, uh, and I think this is worth um, pondering upon, we saw the difference between traditional classroom and online classroom. And that is very important for us to ponder upon as well. Uh, the scaffolding personalized that teachers do naturally in the classroom was an element, an ingredient in the search experience that we haven't accounted for before, but proved really, really important. Uh, and and uh, we could measure that in terms of engagement from the children. So it's worth to factorize in our framework. And finally, emotion and how emotionally charged tasks can be a way to engage even the distracted or the not interested child into search. So this is something that we want to explore further. And in fact, future work and, and where you can help as well. Um, we want to explore the complexity of the task. If you remember, the main difference between the power and the developing searcher was in the, their ability to tackle complex tasks. So we need to explore more this correlation between the search behavior and the complexity of tasks. We know that um, is a factor when adults are searching. We want to explore more in terms of children searching. And we also want to explore different age groups because as I told you, we went for our ideal uh, age group, the nine to, to 11, but we should look into how teenagers search. It's a completely different uh, uh, game and also how younger children are searching. We are now even tackling uh, preschool children and it's, it's a lot of fun, believe me but um, to be taken with a pinch of salt as well. So uh, we have already explored the sense of relevance that children have, and you will be surprised to know that it's slightly different than the, the sense of relevance of their teachers and other adults. So it's something to ponder in terms of measuring the result of the research experience. Maybe a child is perfectly happy with the result that the teacher would just uh, give a very low grade. So we need to be very open about that. Um, the importance of emotion in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation uh, and how to design tasks that are emotionally charged. Uh, we have experts in IR from um, Mia Gordon and uh, Ian Rathman looking into artificial, semi-artificial tasks, but not yet uh, looking into children and how they learn in the classroom. So it's a worth area to explore, definitely. What we are doing, 
but because we have more on board, uh, we are trying to help with the design of a multimodal uh, agent or conversational agent to support our children and provide them with the necessary scaffolding. And anything that has uh, to do with voice or with uh, images or visual cues um, is something that really uh, interests us at this stage. And we are asking you what else you want to do. Uh, what else do you think is worth exploring? But also we would like to uh, invite you maybe to uh, look into um, literature on our children's search and uh, see whether there is anything that is relevant to you. This, this is the exercise we always do. We go to uh, ICIR, we go to CIR and look for inspiration to, um, to bring to the child searching environment. And we haven't noticed that there are not many people coming to us and looking to what we are doing and bringing it back to the adult uh, context. So maybe it would be worth to, to exchange as well. Um, and they'll know. And the, the other thing that is very desired is that, um, as uh, Gian Maria was saying, uh, we are not the first on the board because we don't even have a board, but it's, we don't have a track. Uh, to help us develop as a community and try to better understand how children search. Uh, because uh, working with children and collecting um, data, data sets for children is really complicated. Uh, there are privacy issues, there are um, children protection, there is, uh, you need to get all sorts of committees to approve your study, so it's not an easy thing. But it's doable and it's very rewarding. So the last, now it's true. The very last slide is, uh, let's continue the conversation. You can find our email address and our uh, website. Uh, it would be great if you could cast an eye on our paper. Um, we always use a uh, funny title, um, and this comes from a song in The King and I, just to uh, make you remind uh, that we are a fun group to work with if you want to contact us. So thank you very much, and please ask us any questions. Thank you. Uh, I'll just go to the first one. First one. Hello, Thank you very much. Very, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I have a, really a, a curiosity because it seems uh, challenging. If you have to, let's say, operationalize this in an evaluation campaign, for example, just, just uh, by chance, I mean, how, how do you do ground truth creation? Uh, because it doesn't seem that uh, using the traditional assessor would make any sense in matching relevance for these different uh, uh, roles they play, uh, etc. No, I think that we we want to go and start very simply. So we have great assessors, we have great judges, our teachers. So in the three studies we run, the first one was more like uh, to, to explore and understand what children really wanted. But for at least the second and the third, we had the teachers to tell us what were the relevant results and even to grade um, the submission from the children. So in that way, you have your assessors that are real, you have your tasks that are real, and you have your users that are the children with an extrinsic, not necessarily intrinsic, but an extrinsic motivation in taking part in the study because it's part of their um, day at school, it's part of their curriculum. And that's the best way because if you manage to work with the school and you manage your study to be part of the school program, then also the ethical issues are clear by the school, are taken care of by the school. Parents are informed, children are informed, so everything is much easier. But as you're saying, the problem is then to publish such a data set. So you have to make sure that everything is anonymized, there is no way to understand who child is doing what. And again, this is the easiest way because we don't look into the children's point of view. We look into the teacher and the assessors telling us, oh, this document is the best for answering this, or this answer is very good, and so on. We need to open up and involve also uh, children in the relevant um, assessment, yeah. but we haven't done that. Yeah, because otherwise you risk to bias a little bit with, uh, sorry, uh, it's okay. You, you risk to bias a little bit uh, on, the notion of relevance with uh, how good are the children in getting to that relevance. 
which may be different from their subjective uh, relevance. You are a little bit marking uh, the children on uh, how good they are in the, in the homework and understanding that that's the document. The extrinsic, yeah, the extrinsic part. We have done a little study asking children to co-design with us the emoji for uh, tagging relevant content. And in this way, we find out what they have in terms of the natural sense of relevance. So they represented the relevance as being an open window, as opposed to non-relevant a closed window. Or they represented the relevance with a tick and a cross, because of course in the classroom context, uh, you are ticked and you are crossed if you do something wrong. So um, it's somehow they gave us hints of what relevance is. And you know very well that um, relevance is one of these ineffable concepts. The people do not agree, they just pretend that there is the track like definition that is very superficial, doesn't go any further, but left everybody happy to, to evaluate. So we are working on that. And I think that's very interesting. Yes, that's interesting. So to get a grip of this difference between our children perceive relevant and the teacher. You could do peer review in the classroom, right? From between the students. Did you yeah. consider that already? We haven't done that, but we can. For the older um, age group, definitely it's a, it's a very nice idea and we can implement that. Our educator expert is saying, expert is saying yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If it's still working. No. Like I'm closer. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. And perspective from my like children you answers so you may have answered this question already uh, i was wondering uh, the point you were explaining the different query interfaces and approach uh, of children to search there was like a slide to say like traditional conversational traditional traditional plus emoji so is the um, where the emoji used just for grading or also for querying? No, the emoji were used in the search. We present the children with a search engine result page announced with emoji to help them make sense of what was relevant and what wasn't. And it was a study made in two steps. First, we asked children to design this emoji uh, to uh, represent what was good and what was bad in terms of results. Then we analyzed their suggestion, interpreted the metaphor behind, and came up with uh, two sets of uh, emojis that could work. And then we had them to engage in a study where they were offered the play and the emoji enriched uh, search. And so we analyzed how many clicks, how, many, how much they trusted the emoji, because we also did another little study when we were, rec we were asking children whether they wanted uh, to follow recommendation from other children. So we are trying to explore different directions and combining different um, uh, possible solutions that have been tried and, and very well uh, researched with adults. We are trying to import them to children. But the emoji were in the search. Uh, we are at the moment focusing on the SARS side. There are groups, and we, we are in touch with a nice group in, in Boise again, and another nice group in New Zealand, where they are really focusing on QD formulation and how to help uh, children uh, with QD formulation. We tried the voice in our first study because we made this silly assumption that for children, uh, speaking would help. They wouldn't have to worry about grammar, how I spell this, how I write that. But uh, especially the younger children we thought would embrace that, were the ones that were really, um, how to say, enticed by typing because it was an activity they really liked. So sometimes when we think of studies, I personally don't remember that there always need to be a, a level of fun. In order for a study to work with children, there has to be fun. And because we are grown ups and uh, we don't do fun anymore, uh, as we should, uh, we we are not very careful about that. So you need always to infuse some fun into the study, the way they don't engage with it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you also from my side. It was really interesting to see the results and the insights you gave. Um, I have one question. If, if I understood you correctly, you were essentially taking the, the, the normal search from Bing 
and you're adding emojis in order to um, indicate which results would be interesting for the children, right? Yeah, that was in another study. Yes, yes, yes. In study number two. Yes. Okay. Um, so my question is: so you you had multiple types of, of children, multiple types of actions they performed. So one of them was they were distracted, and another one was where they were exploring. So my question is, did you did you look, for example, maybe also into the type of content which distracted them or which they were exploring? For example, were they also distracted by, let's say, ads provided inside of the search system? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yes. Uh, sorry. The emoji announced was in the, in the study number three. I was wrong. But yes, the distracted child um, is the, the distracted search role. Uh, happens often when there are other sources of information that are competing in the same page. You're absolutely right. We observe those in our experiment. Uh, it's fantastic that uh, if there is a little video with a cute animal or a little cartoon, their attention weighs off, no problem, especially with the young ones. This is why um, the 9 to 11 is our favorite age group because um, initially we also involved primary one and two that are six, seven and eight years old and they are more prone to get distracted. But they also get distracted really, believe me, by the fact that they're typing on a keyboard. And that's fun for them. They enjoy it so much and they forget about the search tasks. So this is a, a level of com not complexity, <laughs> but this is a level of extra care you have to take when you plan such a study. But you're right, ads and this kind of thing. We um, selected uh, resources uh, and we had the teachers to help us so that we minimize the amount of distraction in them, but clearly there was. And there is nothing uh, that is more distracting for somebody uh, than just being, um, I would say, prone to distraction. So some children are more prone to distraction than others. We could see that. And also the topic. Two more questions. Uh, questions, yes. Okay, so does it work? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, have you thought about to, to link it with the digital competence model, your your work? I, I think this might be also an interesting link to, to look after. And just a, a quick other comment uh, regarding the roles you, you mentioned in the very beginning. I think uh, there are, to my opinion, two uh, different dimensions. The first one is the motivation aspect, and the second one are the different uh, roles, but all the different roles can have different kind of motivation, and I think you should try to separate both. That's a very good uh, suggestion, absolutely, I agree. I think that we assume that the um, power searcher uh, is the ideal uh, searcher that has high motivation and high interest and, and everything. But you're right, we should um, slice it down because that's the only way to understand what is going on. And as I said, these roles are not mutually uh, exclusive. So the same child with a different question. So as I told you, the emotionally charged tasks made uh, children engaging, engage into the, the topic and there were no distracted children. So you can play different roles according to how you engage them. We need, um, if we want to go for initiative, uh, as Nicola was saying, we need to um, really come up with tasks that are very well engineered so that they stimulate the children to engage with. But as you're saying, we need better models to slice and look into what is going on behind it. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoy following it. I have, um, it's not a question, it's more than an observation or a suggestion. First, uh, the grade is the quantification of how much the, the, the users or the children get, got, to, you are quantifying the knowledge, right? Which form is the, um, is the questionnaire? Like, are there exams and they are graded? They, they were given as a test or homework at home and they were just answering and they, they, each question was graded between one and ten and our teachers were very generous as well. Okay, so my observation is that would you be interested also in quantifying the user knowledge before they start? Yes, and that's where being in a classroom context helps a lot. Because you have an expert there that is the teacher that knows more or less what kind of interest children have. Because that's that's what 
came up very, very clearly when the online setting happened. Everything that you cannot really measure or formalize disappeared. And so this kind of also emotional support, but um, intuitive understanding of, oh yes, you are, you are so keen on um, history or you really love to travel, so you know this and that, disappeared. And so you're right, this, the, the pre-knowledge somehow being in a classroom setting is not too difficult to assess, to assess and the teacher there can, can provide expertise. Uh, asking children before and after maybe is too cumbersome for them. Okay, so the, cho the chosen topics were assumed that uh, the, the users don't have any previous time. Yes, well, for the Antica Roma, for the ancient Rome uh, exercise, we really timed it with the time they were starting to, okay. to learn that. And that's the beauty of being in a classroom and working with teachers. Otherwise, it would never work. Thank you. Thank you.